I say, we, come on, let's, let's get excited about memory objects. Okay. So, oh, where are we? Memory objects. So these are one of the most important kinds of objects. Um, one of the most important classes, which is a subclass of uh, sim object. So these are objects that interact with the memory system. Um, so caches are a memory object. The memory controller is a memory object. CPUs are a memory object because they have to send requests into the memory system. Um, this is really when you start getting into the interesting things. That's uh, when you start talking about memory objects. So the key thing that makes a memory object a memory object is that it has master. It can have master ports and slight ports, so it can send requests. Um, so in Gem5, all of these requests are built with packets. So all, all everything that flows across the ports are packets. Um, and these are the units of transfer between memory objects. Um, it passes between a master and slave port. And they have a request object, which kind of tells you the um, type of the, the request as well as the address of the request. It has a command, which is a specific thing to do. For instance, write or read, or in the classic caches, it has all the coherence messages like upgrade request, shared request, um, flush requests. These are all different kinds of commands. It has the actual data that you're going to write, or the data that comes back from memory when you read. And packets have lots and lots of other things as well. Um, OK, so let's talk some about how this master-slave port interaction works. Um, so I think we mentioned masters will send a request. So I send a request uh, to a slave, which sends a packet. So the master will call send timing request, and this timing request will go to the slave. On the slave side, the function that gets executed is called receive timing request. So a slave needs to implement receive timing request. Um, then you return true if you can handle that request at the time. So for instance, if you're modeling uh, memory, you return true if you are not currently busy handling something else. Then you execute this request, you get the data out of memory, you stall for some amount, you enqueue an event that's sometime in the future. So say it's just like a really simple memory, you might enqueue an event for 20 nanoseconds in the future. Then you're gonna call, the slave calls send timing response. Um, so this, you use the same packet to respond. And then this calls receive timing response on the master. So the master needs to implement receive timing response. Um, and similarly, the master returns true if you can currently handle that response. If it's busy doing something else, then it has to return false. And we'll see what happens there. So let's see. Let's say the uh, master calls the slave and it actually returns false. The slave is busy handling another request at the time. And it can't handle the new request coming in. So now it's the master's responsibility. Sorry. So it's the master's responsibility to track this packet to make sure it knows it can resend it later. So the slave is busy for some time handling some other request. And then whenever the slave finishes with that other request, it'll call send retry. So then the master knows when it receives a retry that it can try to send again. So this makes it so the master isn't just polling on the slave wasting uh, CPU resources, um, the slave will say, I'm ready now, now you send me another request. So then it calls send timing request again, and the slave returns true. And it doesn't necessarily have to return true, you can send a send retry, even if you happen to be busy with something else. Okay, but in the first, yeah, in the first, the first uh, arrow, yeah. it has to return some true or false. Mm -hmm. Okay, otherwise the master would be blocked. Right, right, and the master is not. Yeah, the master is not blocking. It can go on and do other things. Um, because it answers, otherwise it would be blocked. Because it yes, because you'd have to sit there and wait. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's right. Um, and so this is really a two-step handshake. 
that occurs between masters and slaves. Um, I think in TLM, like system C TLM, it's actually a three-step handshake. And they have one other step in here. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, no? Actually, okay, uh, about the number, uh, that's, that's really brief, but I think in TLM is like begin request, and then end request, begin, mm. and then the, you have initiator and target. The initiator sends a begin request, then the target sends, or not, the end request. Gotcha. So, so, so within this request, there's another layer of, in the sin timing request, you kind of have another layer of flow control in there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. And then similarly, when you call a uh, sin timing response, the master could be busy, so the master can return false, and then it will at some point send the slave a sin response retry, at which time the slave can. Um, try to resend the response. So you have this handshake on either side that allows you to um, be busy and not have to accept every single request. Any other questions there? So this is not exactly the way you would, this is not exactly the way things are implemented in hardware, but it is a good API for creating these event-driven uh, simulations. So, if you want to make a sim object that has a master port or a slave port, then you need to be able to implement, so you have to implement these uh, receives, the receive responses on the master side and the receive requests on the slave side. And we'll look at each one of these in uh, one at a time. So what we're going to do is create a simple mem object. We're going to take our hello object and make it a mem object and essentially have a CPU that talks to our mem object and it's just going to pass things straight through uh, to the memory bus. And then on responses, it's just going to pass things back to the CPU. Any questions? Okay, so let's get started. Oh, so in, where are we? This is not, I gotta find my notes here. Here we are. Source tutorial, hello.py. So let's start by updating the sim object description file. Now, instead of a sim object, we are going to import a mem object. Importantly, it does not have the M5 in front of it. Um, I'm not totally sure why that's different, but don't have M5 in front of that mem object. So from mem object file, we're going to import the mem object object. And then hello is now going to extend that. We're going to keep this latency parameter and add a couple of others. We're going to have an instruction port, which is a slave port and a data port. So these are slave ports since they will be accepting requests from a master port. And then we're going to add a memory side port which is a master port because it's going to send requests to the memory. So now we're going to change the header file. And instead of sim object, we're going to include the memory object. Now public mem object. So let, we'll keep these for now. And
we are going to add a new class to our class. So whenever you are creating a port, you need to um, inherit, create new classes that inherit from master port and slave port. So we're going to create a new class, which is CPU side port. And we're going to use this class for both the instruction and data port. And it's going to um, inherit from slave port. Um, so we are going to give it a member which is the hello object so it can call back into the hello object and also I believe all all ports the master ports and slave ports have to have a mem object pointer um, as one of the uh, members of it. Then we can make our constructor CPU side port um, so this port is going to have a name and then the owner Call our super classes constructor and set the owner. And that's all we need to do for the constructor. And then we need to implement um, these functions that have to be implemented on slave ports. So we need to declare get address ranges. And then receive atomic. And we're going to simply implement this as it's not implemented. That's really distracting, isn't it? Uh -huh. Sam is very loud. Um, so receive atomic, we're not going to talk into it. No, so packet pointer is a type def, which has, um, which is type def as a, a shared pointer, I believe. Um, so let's see, we're not going to worry too much about the atomic and functional accesses. We'll talk about those later. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out is this panic here is another special gem5 debug thing which you use panic if something happened if there's a bug in the code essentially and so we're writing this cpu port to not support atomics so it would be a bug if someone used it in a way that required atomics so therefore we panic um and to get back to the question that you asked a long time ago what's the difference between opt and fast one of the differences is this panic would be um, would not exist if you ran fast. So if you used this in a buggy way, it would act as if the receive atomic worked, even though it didn't. All right, so we're going to do receive atomic, receive functional, of a packet. Um, Override, we are going to do receive timing request. That's a bool, not a book. And receive response retry. So these are all of these function these uh these five functions that we're overriding are the um, 
pure virtual functions in the slide port. And similarly, we're going to add a class uh, memport, memside port. Um, which is a master port. And it's going to look quite similar. In fact, I am going to copy much of this so I don't have to rewrite it. That didn't work. So it's going to have an owner. This time we're going to do the mem side port. And then we are master port. And then the interface that we need to implement this time is a little bit simpler. Not quite so many um, functions. We have our receive timing response. Sounds like he's almost done. I, I, I cannot get that. Stop listening as I write this. Uh, receive request retry. Override. And finally, receive range change. So the receive range change and send address and get address ranges are used for setting up to know which address range is different. Uh, let's see, the crossbars use it to know what, how to send things to different address ranges. Uh, they're required to implement, but they usually are not very complicated. The crossbar is also a memory object since it sends and receives packets. And has master inside port. I mean, it has different logic, um, but yeah, yeah, it's not a particularly special memory object. Okay, so I think that I don't have any typos here, but I'm sure we'll find out later that I do. So, the last thing we need to do is to find the mem object interface. Um, so the mem object interface, we need to um, implement two functions. So a function called get master port, which returns a master port, not very surprisingly, and takes in um, a string, the interface name, as well as the port ID um, similarly we need to implement get slide port And then the last thing we need to change in this header file is we're going to add a couple member uh, member variables. We're going to add a CPU side port. Our instruction port. Another CPU side port, which is our data port. And a mem side port, which is our um, memory port. So we define these two new classes, uh, CPU side port, memory side port, then we're going to have instantiations of these classes here. Um, and then this interface is required to get those ports out when you have the equal sign in Python. Under the hood, it calls these functions.
Everyone done copying down? Let's copy. Okay, so now we get to implement all these things. So first, we need to construct these new objects that we added. So the instruction port. Um, we're going to get the name of this object, which actually a better way is just to grab the name function plus the same thing that we called it in Python, which was inst underscore port. And I'm going to pass in this because it took a hello object as the second parameter. Our data port. And finally, the memory port. Oops. Anyone remember how to redo in <laughs> them? Control R. Control R. Cool. Thank you. Mem side. Yes. So you're just constructing those three objects that we had. You were missing a comma in the, mm -hmm. uh, after the event. Thank you. Okay, so we constructed those objects, and let's quickly implement um, the git master port and git slave port. So, master port reference git git master port. Interface name port ID So all of these git ports look very similar. So if the interface name is what we called it in Python, mem side, then we're going to return the mem port. Otherwise, we're going to call um, mem object get master port and let that deal with if this is one of our parents' um, ports or deal with the error that might occur. Um, so this is what the get master port is going to look like. Um, and this IDX is going to be used, you can have a vector of ports. So if you have a list of ports, maybe um, a crossbar is a good example. You don't know how many things you're going to hook up to that crossbar when you're creating it. So you can have a number of different ports, and then those ports will have different IDs, which are not assigned until um, runtime. So similarly for slave port, just going to copy this. Slave. Slave. Now, if it is the, what do we call it? Inst port, then we want to return inst port. If it is the data port, we want to return data port. Otherwise, we will call up to that. What is the port ID? Hmm? What's the port ID for? Because we haven't used it now. The port ID? The port ID is for um, if you have. Uh, the spectrum of ports. Oh. And so if it's the zeroth port, it'll pass in oh. zero. If it was the third port, it'll pass in three. Um, in the book, there's an example of vector ports. I believe the cache in the book uses vector ports. Okay, any other questions there? 
I don't think we're gonna get to the cash, unfortunately. Um, well, I don't know, so, we're going through this a little bit slow. I recognize that, typing takes a long time. Would you guys rather just look at the code that's complete or type it all out? I see one head nodding for just the code. Any other opinions? Ah, you guys are... Okay, let, let's take a poll. Who wants to just look at code instead of typing? Okay, well that was easy. Okay, fine. All right, so um, we've implemented those, the, the interface. So now we need to implement all this flow control. So the first few things are this get address ranges, send range change, and receive um, functional. So the CPU side port is going to, um, from the CPU, it's going to send get address ranges. And then we're just going to simply pass this through our memory object and send it out the other side. Because our memory object is kind of just a dumb thing that's passing things through. Similarly, from the other side, memory might say, I want to receive range change, in which case we're just going to pass that through over to the CPU side. Similarly with functional packets, if you receive a functional packet, we're just going to send it straight through over to uh, the CPU side. So if we look at this code, um, so we have get address ranges. So the CPU side port, if it receives get address ranges, is going to call get address ranges on the owner. Which is not written in order. And then get address ranges on the owner is going to print out that it's sending new ranges and then send that over to the memory port. So exactly just that passing through. Let's see, the next one was receive range change. So if the memory side port gets a receive range change, we're going to tell the owner to send the range change. And it's going to simply call send range change to the two instruction, or the two uh, slave ports. And then similarly for receive functional, if the C CPU side gets the receive functional, we're going to call it we're going to call handle functional. So have the memory port handle this functional request. Um, and then this simply just forwards it through. So that was a lot faster than me typing it out. It's annoying. Like there's so much, there's a lot of boilerplate in these kinds of things, What's which. The content of such a package that's sent the the functional packages? Mm -hmm. So these are, a better word would be debug packets. Okay. So essentially you want to, so it's used for instance in um, SE mode to load the object file into the simulated memory. So you're going to send all these functional packets that write into the simulated memory in zero time. Okay, so that's it's something that's not So it's a functional only okay. access. Um, so in our case we can just simply send it through. If we were a cache, we might have to check to see if we have the most up-to-date data on a functional access. Okay, so then the next thing we're going to do is this receiver timing, timing request. So if we have a timing request come in from the CPU, we're going to call handle request on our memory object. If the memory object is currently blocked, then we're going to tell the CPU, we're going to reply uh, false to that um, receive timing request because we can't handle it. If it's not blocked, then we're going to say that we're now blocked and not, re not, not have any other packets coming in. Then on the memory side port, we're going to send a packet. And the send packet is going to handle the flow control for us. So I send the packet. If send timing request happens to fail, if the um, memory side object can't handle it, then we're going to save that packet 
and remember it. Wait until we receive a, a receive response retry, and then resend the, try to resend the packet again. Um, and so then we just call send timing request. Does that flow control make sense? This is the general flow control that's going to be used for almost all memory, op memory objects. So if we look at this code, um, let's see, wh where do we start? We start with receive timing request. So if the owner cannot handle the request, then we return false. Otherwise, we return true. We need to remember that we need to send a retry sometime in the future as well. And then handle request. If it's blocked, then we're, we're going to return false. Otherwise, we're going to set block to true and call send packet. The CPU side send packet does this panic if something's blocked. So if the bug is happening, it'll panic and let us know. Otherwise, we try to send timing response. Oop. This was CPU side. I was looking for mem side port. The memory side port, we send timing request. And if this fails, then we need to save this packet because we're in charge of remembering the packet. Oop. OK, so then receive request free tries the other thing to look at. Receive request retry. So if we receive a retry, so that means the send timing failed. So we're going to receive a retry. That means we better have a, a block packet. We, we saved that block packet because the sending failed. So then we grab that block packet, um, set that to null, and then try to send it again. And if we remember from send packet, memory side port, if it fails to send, then we save the blocked packet. So we're trying to encapsulate as much of the flow. I try to encapsulate as much of the flow control as possible inside the ports, inside my implementation of the port, instead of trying to deal with it inside the memory object. Make sense? OK, so similarly, we could. I won't go through all the code here. We can also do uh, the receive timing response, handle the response, um, and this is all very similar um, going to the other side. The only thing that um, is slightly different is When we're handling the response from memory, we're going to send the packet um, to the instruction port or the data port, depending on if it's instruction or data. Um, and then we need to call try, send, retry on these ports. So this try, send, retry is a function that I implemented, which within the port looks at if this port needs to send a retry. So if it had failed before, so if the CPU had sent a request and we replied, no, I can't handle it, then that means we need to send a retry to the CPU at some point. So we're going to remember that we need to send a retry and then call send retry request if we need to. Yeah? So um, where the extra cycles each So in this simple memory object, we're ignoring any extra overhead for doing this. We're just sending things straight through. If you wanted to add a delay here, um, when you say, uh, let's see here, we'll, we'll look at the cache, which actually does um, handle a delay. So here, if we receive a timing request, we're going to call handle request again. So this looks very similar. 
with some extra flow control around it. And then handle request, rather than just doing the request, what we do is schedule a new event. And this here, this latency, is how we deal with the latency it takes to access the cache. Does that make sense? So if you want to add, if you want to model the latency of something, model the amount of time it takes, you need to add these um, uh, events in order to model that latency. Um, and so while we're here, we'll look at a slightly more complicated use of event function wrapper. Um, so here we are using the C++ Lambda functions. And this function that we want to call access timing takes a parameter packet. And so we are capturing this packet from the local namespace. So this variable packet is being captured here, and then we pass it on into our function. So if we continue looking at this, um, so the cache gets a request, just like our memory object. But instead of forwarding it, we're going to look at this access timing. So this access timing is going to functionally access. Oops. We're going to functionally access. Ah, there it is. We're going to functionally access the cache. So this means we're going to go check the cache, see if it's a hit or miss. If it's a hit, we're going to copy the data into the packet. Um, if it's a miss, we just return false. We can look at that. So importantly, I've separated out the functional part of the simulation from the timing part of the simulation here. Um, actually, before this, we'll come back to this in a second. Let me hop through a few slides. So how do we want to model a cache? How do we model things like the data storage, the tags, the associativity, the data access latency, whether it's blocking or not. Um, now, what do you think? How would you model it? What, what code would you write to model this cache? How would you model data storage? What code would you, what code would you write to store the data? So you could do something as complex as a sim object. That's possible. Um, you can also do something. So this is like within our sim object of the cache. How would you store that data? Yeah. STL. Yeah, you could do an STL list. Map. A map. So if you did a map, what would? Uh, how would you be storing the tags? Like the key to the map would be the tag, right? Yeah. So this is, you know. The simplest, dumbest thing you could possibly do is use a map to do the data storage, the tags, model a fully associative cache. Um, for the data access latency, we can make an event, like I was just showing. Um, and you know, whether it's blocking or not, you could actually implement MSHRs and have um, things off to the side where you hold data while other things are, um, while other requests are happening. Uh, but the cache that I've implemented here is a fully blocking cache because uh, it's a little bit easier. That's a terrible noise. Okay, so um, oh, is it a fan? I bet it's a fan of like the air conditioner. Um, we'll try to ignore it, just like we tried to ignore that talk earlier. <laughs> That failed. Maybe this will fail as well. So the design of the cache. Um, so when the handle request comes in, we're going to call access timing with a delay. In access timing, we're going to do this functional thing separately. If it's a hit, then we're just going to reply with the data. If it's a miss, then what we need to do is upgrade the request from, say, a 64-bit request, an 8-byte request, to a full cache line size request. And then in handle response, we need to insert that data into the cache, 
when we get the response from memory, and then um, we can then call access functional to get that data out or write the data that we need to, and then reply. So let's look at some of this code real fast. Um, so an access functional, that's awful. Oh, I thought it was gonna stop. The, so we're gonna extract the block address from the packet. So we're gonna do a whole block at a time in the cache. Then we use this cache store, which is gonna be a, um, it's a standard map, like we talked about. And we're gonna search for the block address. If it is um, in the map, so if this uh, iterator is valid, then if the packet is a write, we're just gonna simply, this packet write data to block, writes the data, which is in the standard map, um, automatically offset by the block size. So you, by doing packet write data to block, um, we actually pull the block, the offset out. And so it only gets the offset data from this um, block of unsigned integers. If it's a read, then we set the data packet instead of writing the data um, similarly from a block. And if it's neither a read nor a write, then we just give up and say, we don't know how to deal with this. That's very exciting. So um, where is the write data to block set data to These are functions um, defined in the packet class. Yeah. They're automatic things that packets have. Um, so if it was a hit, we're going to return true. And if it was not a hit, we'll return false. So if we go back to access timing. So if it's a hit, great. We can update a stat for that. And then we call packet make response. So that converts the packet command from a read request to a read response. And once we've created, um, made the response, we can just send the response in the same way as what we were passing through before. So we get a hit, um, and then we just send the response. And again, we're, access, we're modeling the latency because this access timing function got called after the hit latency. Now, in the more complicated case that we have a miss, um, we need to get the whole, so, so we need to upgrade the request um, to a full size 64 byte cla cache line and then send it on. And so this is going to be done uh, down here in this else statement. We allocate a new packet, which is a block size size. Uh, I'll talk in probably after lunch about what this, uh, how this packet allocate works. And then we need to save this packet that we got from the CPU in order to use it to respond later. So we've created a whole new packet to send on. And then we just send that packet forward. And again, you know, uh, we encapsulated this flow control inside the ports of like send packet. So we don't have to worry about whether the send packet fails or not. We just call the function and the port will deal with if uh, the other side is blocked. Okay, so then there's the other side, which is receive um, timing response. We call handle response, just like before. And then on this side, when we get a response, we're gonna insert the packet into the cache. And then we sample the latency, which is a statistic. And then if we had this original packet, if we'd upgraded the request, then we go ahead and call um, access functional here uh, to actually either write that packet, write the data to the cache, or read the data out of the cache. Um, and then we use this weird in 5 bar use thing here. Um, so we keep this hit information and then panic if it's not a hit. Because we just inserted it, it better be a hit. So there's some, yeah. 
So let's see. We inserted the data. So now we're going to functionally access the cache again. Is it the timing that is functional? No, so access functional is not timing. This is the functional either get the data out of the cache or write the data to the cache. Function. So this is this function we're in is in the response side. So once we get a response back from memory. Oh, because let's see. Because the timing access checks for a hit or a miss. Well, the timing access does not. Oop, sorry. The timing access does not deal with this original packet thing correctly. We need to deal with this logic separately. It's not a very satisfactory answer. I'm sorry. Oh, well, so we. So this was, we only get a response on a miss. So this packet, the original packet, does not have the, so if it was a read, it doesn't have the data that's in the cache yet, the data that it's supposed to read. And if it's a write, it hasn't written to the cache yet. Because the upgrade request is just a memory read to pull the data into the cache. So we still need to do this access functional here. to either read or write the original request from the CPU. So this M5RU is, is needed because if you were to compile this with fast, this panic would go away and then you get a compile error or a compile warning saying this variable hit is never used. So you'll often see this M5RU thing around um, asserts and panics. So this is just for only fast to cater with gem5.fast binary? Yes, so the gem5.fast binary, so it doesn't give you uh, an error when you build it. Yeah. So then the other thing we need to do is delete this packet that we sent to memory. So what's the insert? Oh, yeah, 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 insert. So this inserts it into the cache, which is more complicated than it needs to be. So a bunch of asserts, it should be block aligned. Then we check for the capacity. So if this map has more data in it than the capacity of our cache, then we need to evict something. So this is a bunch of code to completely randomly evict something. Um, and once we've evicted something, then we create a new packet and write it back. Now interestingly, this cache does not have a dirty bit. So that means we have to write back everything, whether or not, we, since we don't know if it's uh, been read or written, we have to write back everything. So then we write it back by calling send pack. We create this new packet and then call um, send packet on the memory port to write it back. Um, and then we can delete the entry. Once we have space in the cache, we allocate a new chunk for the data and then insert the data into the cache. So that's what insert does. Uh, where were we before? Handle response. So yeah, so after we insert into the cache, we make sure to access functional, then we just set send a response to the CPU. And we're done with uh, receiving that request. So I believe that is pretty much everything to cache us to this cache. Questions? Since we didn't go through it line by line, I'm sure that it's not quite. Does, the good thing about going through it line by line is you get every single detail. Going through it like this, it's a little bit more hand wavy. Um, okay, so we'll do a couple more. Eh.